Hi, my name is Peter Shields, and on behalf of Airmet Scientific, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Advancements in Urban Air Quality Monitoring, to be presented by Paul Pickering, the Global Project Development Manager for AeroQual in New Zealand. Paul has vast experience in this area, and I'm sure he will provide you with some really interesting insights on the new technologies in urban air quality monitoring and how these can improve your monitoring programs. Over to you, Paul. Right, welcome everyone to um, this presentation on advancements in urban air quality monitoring. Over the last uh, couple of years, there's been a lot of advancements in uh, technology and air monitoring technology coming faster, smaller, and uh, connections are um, more modern. The platforms are uh, more slick to use. So uh, this has opened up new opportunities for air quality professionals looking to answer questions that weren't answered in the past. So this product has been in response to that need. And as we focus on some of the applications and features and technology, this may open up a few questions that you have, and we welcome those at any time during the presentation. Firstly, I'd just like to introduce Aerocol. For those of you who don't know who, who we are, we're a manufacturer of air quality monitoring equipment and software platforms. We've been in existence since 2001. As you can see in this uh, presentation slide, we have a uh, factory and laboratories head office in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, last year, we were very proud to be awarded the New Zealand High Technology Award. This is a prestigious award given to uh, manufacturers who have an export or international focus, and uh, that was awarded for the AQM65 compact air quality station. It's not always known, but um, our instruments are used in more than 70 countries. Currently, there are more than 10,000 instruments, Aerocol instruments, in use around the world at this moment. And since we introduced Aerocol Cloud, about 2,000, 2,500 of those instruments are actually connected online. And that has uh, given us a wealth of experience and knowledge of what's happening in the industry for air quality monitoring, particularly for urban applications. And that's what we wanted to just share with you today, some of the learnings um, and particularly how those needs that we're seeing and trends that we're seeing develop around the world can be met through new technologies. And uh, finally, uh, Aerocore has a, a, a large um, component of our company is devoted to product development and research. And uh, so we have a few patents on new sensor technology. As you'll find in the next slide, a lot of this uh, new, new technology has come through partnerships. One of the key partnerships that Aerocore has is with the US EPA. We are a leading technological partner with their program to develop next generation air monitoring. So while this was on hold during um, the phase in of the new president, it's now business as usual. Uh, we're also backed by the New Zealand government. For those of you who have a UK background, we're a partner with the MCERTS program, and that's around uh, certifying of gas and PM measurement technology. So MCERTS means that our products can be used on the UK Environment Agencies or DEFRA uh, projects. So while it may not be so relevant to Australia and New Zealand, the fact that this certification exists and the products carry this is really important in terms of credibility for urban air quality monitoring. Just a, a quick snapshot of who our clients are. It's really important to know uh, where this technology is being used particularly for urban applications. So a, a lot of consultants are currently using it and then agencies at municipal level for urban air monitoring, roadside monitoring and uh, transport corridors. Some of our other uh, partners are involved in the oil and gas industry and resource industry. Many of you are already familiar with Eurocog and some of our products, um, possibly the handheld instrumentation. We've recently added to this a, a PM sensor head which allows the instrument, along with the gas sensor heads, to be suitable for use for urban air quality monitoring applications where you need to do some uh, walkthroughs or uh, hotspot monitoring or very short-term monitoring. But uh, the products of real interest today are the AQM65, which is our um, compact air quality station, and this in, in many ways can serve as a substitute for um, reference uh, stations, and the AQS, urban air quality monitor. And that's really what we want to focus on is the technological advancements for urban air quality monitoring and how they're represented by this particular product and how it might be used by air quality professionals in Australasia. The other thing of interest is our AQY platform. And that's a, an R&D platform which is generating new products. And in particular, 
one that we expect to see next year is Pixel Air, which will be um, a very low cost uh, instrument uh, designed for network applications for the consumer and organization markets, such as schools, uh, companies that are setting up networks on their premises, etc. And that will be dedicated to PM and ozone. Uh, as indicators of air quality. This is where the AQS sits in our current platform and it's very similar to the dust profiler and dust entry which many of you may already be using or are familiar with as a, um, a PM a monitoring device. So the AQS is in the same um, product family as the dust monitor. I just wanted to at a high level talk about what the AQS is and how it's relevant to urban air quality monitoring. What Air quality professionals are telling us that they need, and that includes regulators, researchers, environmental consultants, and occupational hygienists, is something that's really flexible. A platform that can uh, bring in data inputs from noise, meteorological gases, and or target gases and particulates into one device, which is robust enough to be used in outdoor applications or confined spaces such as tunnels, construction, and demolition sites. In addition, the feedback has been for something that's lightweight and that can be used on street infrastructure. So it doesn't use a, um, a, a footprint such as a typical station. And uh, feedback has been, has been more and more becoming more and more difficult to get uh, permissions, to get access for monitoring sites in urban areas, particularly built up uh, CBDs. So in response to um, these trends, this product has been designed to be a flexible platform. It's anchored off a robust optical part particle monitor. And we've added to that some key sensor, gas sensor um, analyzer modules. So at a very high level, this instrument measures your four PM uh, criteria uh, panels of uh, TSP, uh, PM10, PM2.5, and PM1. And we can add to that ozone, NO2, and VOCs. Other peripherals such as solar radiation, noise, and meteorological data are very easily uh, added to this platform as plug and play. The benefit of that is that you're bringing your meteorological and acoustic measurements into one platform, one instrument and one data platform. Other third party sensors can be added and in time as demand increases for vibration or um, other comfort factors, these um, can feasibly be added to the existing um, infrastructure. But uh, essentially this is a lightweight and high performance instrument designed for targeted applications in urban environments. So as such our um, focus has been on getting the measurement quality to uh, the same standard as an EPA reference instrument and in comparison tests the data quality is well above uh, 0.9 in correlations and as high as 0.98 in correlation tests. The other key thing to keep in mind is this instrument is really easy to deploy. In about 10 minutes you can have it installed and be logging data. So as such it means it's easy to uh, redeploy, it can be um, stored on sites and rental or hire applications quite easily and so it lends itself to short-term monitoring um, applications or long-term monitoring where you, you need a lightweight network such as an urban um, city environment. So just getting down to some of the applications or urban applications where this technology is now being uh, used. Uh, construction and demolition sites are by far and away one of the key applications for this newer technology. And some of the trends we're seeing out of Europe, and particularly out of the UK, is a demand to monitor uh, PM2.5 as well as PM10 in real time. And since the uh, Non-Road Mobile Machinery Act was brought in, uh, earlier this year, there is also a demand to monitor NOx emissions from uh, diesel engines used on construction sites. In fact, according to um, the literature, uh, about 25% of urban emissions are coming from construction related machinery. So, in the ultra low emission zones, which have uh, been planned for London, in fact, become effective next year, and in other European cities. There is now demand for real-time monitoring of PM10, PM2.5, and uh, NO2, and that is to capture the uh, environmental impact and the health and safety impact of emissions from construction machinery. Another area where this newer technology lends itself is for roadside studies. 
in the past, it's been very difficult to uh, to get uh, real time in, um, information and equipment into roadside um, applications due to the size and complexity and cost of the monitoring equipment. But with new technology now, it's possible to set up short and long term roadside traffic uh, emission studies. So there we're capturing PM2.5 and uh, NO2 primarily. Other applications um, include rail corridors and uh, that includes uh, metro applications where you've got rail terminals and you've got high particulates or emissions from related equipment. And of course ports and other industrial perimeters where you may have a spike in, in SO2 from heavy fuel emissions, definitely particulates or uh, NOx emissions. Another application that we're seeing a lot of demand for in Australia, particularly on the East Coast and other urban areas, is for remediation uh, monitoring. And uh, there are many examples of where land has been repurposed, assets are um, being uh, changed for um, other uses, and that requires earthworks on sites where um, previously they've been polluted. And uh, there's a requirement to measure not just particulates, but perhaps VOCs and other toxics that are coming out of the soil during this process. And for those of you who, are, who have a, a background in perhaps the regulatory side or the research side, Another area is community exposure studies, and this is, is a new area because it's made, been made available by a real-time technology suitable for the application, lightweight networks that are able to detect uh, PM, ozone, NO2, and related uh, pollutants in real time. Now, previously, a lot of these studies were done using diffusion tubes, but the resolution was restricted to weekly or monthly. But now with newer technologies, we're able to um, pick up real-time data. One minute data is quite feasible, but definitely one hour or 15 minute averages. Smog formations, perhaps not such a big issue here in Australia and New Zealand, but definitely in the Asian countries. But the combination of ozone and PM2.5 creating photochemical smog is a common challenge they're dealing with. And uh, um, there is a requirement for mapping it. And not just to do this by satellite, but to actually measure it on site. Some of our, uh, our audience may be doing modelling, and uh, modelling is, is quite a popular and cost-effective way of sending air quality data for an area, but again, those models need to be validated in some form. The newer technology is lending itself to this application also. So this is just a snapshot of current applications where new advancements in urban technology, urban air quality technology are being used. I'd like just to focus for a, a few minutes on the AQS. Some of the, the features of this technology technology that's part of what make it unique and uh, perhaps things that will give us pause to think and think about what's really needed for the measurement quality. One of the primary things in our opinion is a pump sampler. If you're really serious about measuring air quality, you've got to be able to control flow. And if you control flow, then you can control the hygiene of the analyte. And that means you're able to use inert materials such as kyna, a glass, um, PFE, etc. Medical grade stainless steel preserves the integrity of the analyte. Uh, you're also able to put a filter on the inlet which allows you to remove particulates from particularly a gas um, sample and that has another benefit in being able to um, lengthen the, the life of pumps and other uh, parts in the pneumatic um, line by having filters in there. Thirdly, by using a pump active sampling method, you're able to control flow, which is quite critical in urban environments where you've got changing uh, flow rates and fluctuation due to topography and wind and weather patterns. So that's a key feature in our opinion is to, um, to use pump sampling on any of these newer lower cost devices, uh, in our opinion, is critical. The second thing is to, to have a heated PM inlet. All of Aerocol products use a heater on the PM inlet. The effect of that is to dry the sample and uh, cause any particles that are uh, amalgamating through um, high humidity effects to expand to their true particle size. A heated PM in that, that could be controlled by a thermostat or a humidity point uh, allows you to um, avoid false readings on particle sizes. Coming to the gas technology, uh, one of the unique features of this technology is an ABC technique, which is uh, automatic baseline correction. And that allows us to ensure very high stability of the gas measurement during humidity events or temperature events or seasonal or diurnal changes. For those of you who are familiar with electrochemical sensors and solid state sensors, you'll know 
that uh, one of the challenges is overcoming the effect of humidity and temperature change. In addition, there's cross interference from other gases. For example, an NO2 uh, electrochemical sensor is, is highly cross sensitive to ozone. So th these are uh, some of the challenges that can be overcome through infrastructure around the sensor. One of these that Aerocol applies is the ABC automatic baseline correction. What that means is that during the measurement cycle, we're modulating between sample on and sample off, effectively between a, a sample and a zero condition. In a zero condition, the analyte is destroyed or is, the flow is turned off or it's chemically scrubbed. And at that measurement, uh, the measurement at that point has to be the absolute true zero. When the sample is switched on through a solenoid valve, during the flow condition, we're measuring the actual analyte uh, concentration. The delta or difference between the zero condition and the sample condition has to be the true uh, concentration. The advantage of doing this at every measurement cycle, which is every minute, means that uh, we're able to take into account or compensate for any change in temperature and humidity in the external environment. So a couple of things that we do is we try to keep the, uh, the gas modules as stable as possible in terms of temperature and humidity. And secondly, by modulating the flow between sample and zero condition, we're able to remove the effect of any changes in temperature and humidity. Because as you know, uh, temperature and humidity changes are, uh, are not as fast as a one minute uh, measurement cycle. So at the raw measurement end, we're uh, measuring every minute and uh, then you're able to, with that data, you're able to um, create your averages for a five minute, 10 minute, hourly, 24 hourly, etc. The other advantage of these new technologies is that with advancements in sensors in solid state, photochemical and electrochemical, and particularly because Aerocol is one of the, uh, is a sensor manufacturer, we're able to tune these sensors for measuring part per billion of gases. Now we use a combination of tungsten oxide, um, molybdenum oxide, chromium oxide for these sensors. So they're tuned uh, particularly to a certain category of gases. In addition, we use photoionization detectors and in some cases electrochemical sensors with additional infrastructure. The other thing that's really important with all of these instruments is calibration. So factory calibration in our case is done to NATO accredited standards. Uh, we do that in the factory and that calibration is transferable onto the field. And what we mean by that is if you use a certified standard for the calibration, whether it be a, in a gas cylinder or through a certified or traceable diluter, then you're able to transfer a similar standard, a accredited standard to the instrument. The protocol for calibrating these instruments in the field and in the factory is the same and is replicable because it's using US EPA uh, protocols for calibration. The final two aspects that make this product unique is that it's designed for outdoor environments. So unlike some of the other instruments on the market, uh, Aeroqual's um, perspective has to come from the outside in uh, rather than from the inside out. So these instruments are designed for, for operating in, in really tough environments. We've got hundreds and hundreds of these things operating in the Middle East where the temperatures are in excess of 55 degrees Celsius and are extremely dusty. So we're, we're confident that they can operate in urban air quality environments, which are much more benign. However, uh, instruments do get knocked around. Um, they get hit by machinery and uh, construction activities or in the urban environment by uh, vehicles. So they're designed to pretty tough with aluminium skin enclosures, uh, air gaps around the enclosures for uh, insulation and protection. In this picture here, you can see a, a consultant standing next to an instrument on a tripod. And finally, Aerocol is a great believer in using wireless platforms. And at the network level, around the instrument, at the local network level, you communicate with the instrument via um, cell phone or, or tablet or PC wirelessly. So each instrument has a wireless hotspot. At the wider um, network level, we're using uh, 4G LTE modems. And that means that we're able to communicate with instruments around the world, doesn't matter where they're located. So long as they can get online, then we're able to communicate with the instrument for diagnostics and data management. Uh, these four features are just some of the things that make this uh, technology unique. Aeropol is certainly not the only manufacturer that's affecting um, aspects in this uh, area, but we're probably one of the few manufacturers that's able to understand what 
consultants and hygienists are looking for and regulators and bring it together in a single package that meets those needs. Just at uh, um, a high level, what makes the technology unique? Firstly, using ozone, te ozone measurement uh, technology that has the same sensitivity, stability and selectivity as a US EPA analyzer. Ericol's ozone sensor has been renowned around the world for this uh, performance. Now when we couple that with a NO2 sensor, we're able to remove any ozone interference and along with our ABC technique, we're able to remove the diurnal and seasonal um, temperature and humidity effects. So we get a very stable baseline measurement. Evidence of that is the drift at zero is very minimal over periods of three months or longer. For a particulate measurement, we're using nephilometry and that light scattering technology has been well proven, uh, particularly for urban environments where you want real-time data. Finally, to sum up, um, we use an EPC uh, that's running Linux and the EPC stores the data and it'll store more than five years of data at one minute uh, frequency. That means that if you ever have an interruption in the, the, the connection, whether it's via Wi-Fi or by the GSM network, you never lose the data. The data is always stored on the EPC. And if you do lose connection, it will simply back it up over the cloud or over the Wi-Fi once you're reconnected. The other thing to keep in mind is, is that with uh, these instruments being much smaller, um, the power consumption is lower and therefore you can operate them on batteries or uh, solar panels. And that's really helpful in uh, urban environments or remote uh, environments where you may not have access to mains power. Being able to run on a battery or solar panel is extremely handy. Just a, a quick snapshot of the software, and this is the other important aspect to air quality monitoring, is being able to use the data, and, and really this is what people are, are most, uh, that they'll tend to be, uh, relate to most, is the, the actual software. The instrument itself is a box in the field, and so long as we know that that measurement is reliable and is consistent with EPA reference methods, then the rest of it is how can we make this data easy to use for our customers. The Aerocall platform uses Aerocall Connect and Cloud. It's a very secure platform using encryption over the cloud. What that means is that we're able to see all the instruments around the world. So here in our, our technical department, we're able to see more, currently more than 2,500 instruments. Um, we're able to provide uh, technical uh, port uh, updates to the firmware and software over the cloud. Uh, that happens without most people even realising it. The data is protected, however, and uh, as a user, you're able to set up um, uh, various uh, permissions as to who sees uh, what level of the data and uh, what view. So you're able to determine that, whether it's for your end client, for yourself, or for technical support. All your, your common um, features for urban monitoring, such as uh, SMS and email alerts, are all easily configured. You're able to set up a calibration and service regimes and routines and reminders, and that's something that we can assist you with. And another feature that's really useful for urban applications is FTP of, of data. So that means you're able to set up an auto export of the data. It can be at one minute frequency right through to 24 hour averages. That will allow you to bring it into a third party database. So when we FTP the data, it's in a, a CSV or XML uh, format which is universal and uh, that's fantastic if you're running a, a lot of instruments on a single database and you don't want to be dealing with individual uh, software platforms you can FTP the data directly into that database. A lot of our customers are doing this for large projects. So that's in addition to being able to bring other instruments and sensors into the uh, Aerocall Cloud and Connect. So that's at an instrument level but at a software level you're able to export the data into third-party databases. So that means that if you're using EnviroSuite or EnviroDAS or Eridas uh, or a custom-built um, database, so long as it can accept the CSV or XML file format, you can bring this data directly into uh, your platform. We're trying to make it easier for uh, users to bring the data and, um, and combine that with existing platforms uh, without having to change. In the software itself, you're able to plot and download all the data as real-time or historical data sets, and you, you can set your um, averaging from uh, five minutes through to 24 hours. Very easy to use and very intuitive. In the advanced charts, uh, this is perhaps some of the features that are of real um, appeal for air quality professionals, and that's 
the ability to be able to plot uh, all your parameters in one graph can be over whatever um, time period that you selected that. And then if you're running a network, you can actually, um, in network view, you can see those parameters for every instrument in one graph view. Now, the, the beauty of that is that you're able to see the richness of air quality information coming from the site at a snapshot view. In the past, uh, people had to export the data into um, third party party programs to be able to do this. But, uh, with uh, Iroquois Advanced Charts Tools, you can do this all on the on your computer using the existing software or existing software license. And other charts, such as uh, rose charts for wind speed, wind direction, and pollution, are all readily available. And you can export these. You can put them in, in air quality reports straight out of the software. If you're a, a large user and uh, you can see the benefit of these instruments in the, in, as a network, for a CBD application, for example, we do offer uh, an API handshake code. So that means if uh, you're a city and you've, you're using your existing database and you don't require um, the cloud, then you can use the API. With a small amount of work from a programmer, you're able to talk directly to the instrument. At a, at a high level, that's what this software package can do. Uh, we've already talked about um, how you can make the data traceable on these um, advanced instruments. Uh, but it does start with the calibration in the factory. Um, we use NIST traceable standards, which um, in this uh, part of the world translate from data accreditation, and standard reference materials that are, are freely available in the field, such as CalGas, or air liquid CalGas, BOC gases, scrub gases. Uh, there's a number of manufacturers in, or suppliers in Australia. In the other uh, picture there, you can see a consultant. He's running a short-term um, monitoring session in a uh, traffic application. That monitoring period could be anywhere from um, eight hours to a couple of days. He's got an instrument on a tripod and during the commissioning he's actually doing a calibration. So you can see he's running a span gas through a uh, Aerocol portable diluter which is then feeding a um, calibration standard to the instrument for doing the span calibration. Now uh, Aerocold calibrators also have a um, integrated zero air generator. It's a heated carolite um, generator, so it's removing all VOCs and carbons uh, from the zero. And so that's another option. Uh, alternatively, some of our customers use synthetic zero air to the zero. Now, this calibration can be done in the office or lab or in the field. In many cases, the factory calibration is quite suitable, but a consultant, depending on the length of the monitoring period, may wish to do a field calibration either at the beginning or the end of the sample period. Natural question is how is this equipment supported? Aerocol uh, really encourages people to uh, be online, either via the Wi-Fi connection or uh, the GSM uh, GPRS modem. Because once you're connected to uh, Aerocol Cloud, you get all the benefits of our support, which includes what we've learned from having two and a half thousand instruments in connected in real time around the world. And that's a 24-7 relationship with Aeropol. So that means that we can assist you at any time to either set up the instrument, deal with any anomalies or technical issues you're having, even look at the data to see if there's an issue with the site where you're measuring or if there's any interferences that we're able to observe based on experience, etc. We've got a support center in Auckland, which allows us to uh, diagnose um, the health of the instrument and even generate reports on the air quality on your, on your site, um, but more importantly, in Australia, you, you have the benefit of partnership with uh, Airmet Scientific. They've got offices in seven states. As a partner, they were able to do all of this at a local level, and then of course, they're able to rely on us for um, support on anything that's really outside of uh, the ordinary. So the key thing um, here is that you're supported. Once you uh, connect with Aerocom, you're supported through a local partner and through our technical department. A lot of this um, does sound like too good to be true, being able to measure urban air quality pollutants at the same level or um, accuracy and performance as US or Australian standards uh, analyzers. So what I want to just present over the next few minutes is just the evidence from some co-locations. Now, before Aerocol release any technology onto the market, we do uh, testing in a variety of climates. Here, the AQS has been tested in New Zealand, the US, and uh, China. Most of this testing happened last year and has continued on into uh, 2017. Now you'll see there in Auckland, 
that there's two AQS monitors sitting on top of the roof of a uh, Auckland Council uh, reference station. Now, that, that reference station is measuring NO2 in particulate. It's using a Teledyne API T200 uh, uh, analyzer for measuring um, uh, NOx and NO2. And you can see that in comparison, the size and of the instruments, and we're measuring exactly the same parameters, uh, particulates and uh, you know, two, and, and we're also measuring ozone actually as well. Uh, but that just gives you a, a, a reference point in terms of size. In terms of cost, you're looking at an instrument that uh, a station that might be costing around about two hundred thousand Australian dollars, with uh, the AQS, which would come in at around about ten percent of that. For the instrument itself, and then with a few peripherals, you might be looking at around about twenty-five thousand. But you you considerably much lower um, cost point. In the US, you can see in the red circle there, the AQS has been installed at uh, one of the EPA's super sites, and there's a broad range of equipment from volume samplers through to uh, EPA stations that are um, are at the super site. Very similar to what uh, New South Wales OEH have in uh, their site at Chalora. And then in China, um, this test was done by uh, one of the environmental monitoring uh, centres, uh, the government um, agency. So this, that's the, at, at a very high level, the context of these co-location tests. Let's just have a look at some of the data now. So here we're looking at the two AQS units that are sitting on top of the Auckland Council chemiluminescence um, based um, monitoring station. And you can see that reference um, instrument is in blue, and one of the AQS is in orange, the other is in green. Now, this is a one hour average uh, location or correlation. So, the key things that are worthy of, of, of noting here uh, is following the same trend uh, very closely. Secondly, the sensitivity of these new instruments is right down to zero. So, that means you're able to pick up all of the background NO2 measurements or uh, concentrations um, below 5 ppb. Now that's unique to this technology. There are other low cost instruments on the market now at similar price points that are measuring uh, NO and uh, NOx and NO2, but none of them are able to get down to uh, less than 10 ppb of um, NO2. So that's a couple of highlights out of what we're seeing in this data here is a very consistent trend and sensitivity is right where it needs to be right up there with EPA analyzers. Now, what we're seeing here is a data comparison of an instrument that is a fraction of the size and of the cost. That's part of the value proposition of these tech, these newer technologies to get that sensitivity and stability. Bear in mind too that reference stations are usually calibrated um, every week or certainly every month. And the AQS instruments can be calibrated at the same frequency, but when you look at the data set like this, the requirement to calibrate is, is nowhere near as uh, demanding. Uh, here's your uh, R2 squares, and again, you can see a really close correlation on the NO2 channels between the reference and the AQS instrument. Here we're looking at the ozone channel from the United States, um, and again, you can see a very close correlation and the sensitivity down low. Um, these are the two outstanding features, and of course, price point um, and size of the instrument are key advantages. But what, what these uh, graphs are showing is that you can have confidence in the data coming from these instruments. And that's, that's been something that's been developed over the last 10 years. It's not an accident. It's not, not nothing really new to the market. But uh, the fact that this data quality is right up there with uh, US EPA analyzers means that you can have confidence in the data. It's defensible and therefore is suitable for applications where in the past you might have been looking at diffusion tubes or having to um, uh, get large stations in. Uh, here's the PM 2.5 data from the United States. Again, quite a, quite a good correlation. Uh, bear in mind that this was a 24 hour, 24 hour average from the uh, government site, and the AQS data is, uh, is one minute real time. So sometimes there's going to be a little bit of uh, variation uh, because of the time series. The important thing is that the trend is the same. Here we're looking at the uh, ozone data from China, and you can see you're getting peaks of over 100 ppb during the uh, Chinese summer, uh, particularly around midday. Uh, but again, a very close correlation. And here's the PM 2.5 data, uh, also very similar 
uh, high, high correlation, one hour average. And from time to time, you'll see uh, the reference data drops out, as you can see in this graph here. And that mo no doubt was probably due to service or a calibration. So uh, that's all well and good, but let's uh, find out what it's like in the field. Uh, where are these instruments being used and what's the relevance to the Australia and New Zealand market? So one of the key, key applications we've already been discussing is construction sites now. Um, the same uh, regulatory obligations that we're seeing in the UK for some time now to monitor PM10 at the boundary and now PM2.5 and in some cases NO2, uh, we're seeing that same trend in Australia and New Zealand. So many consultants are required to provide um, dust and PM data um, on the boundaries on behalf of their clients. Here's an example from London where um, the Aerocol dust entries were used, um, about six or eight of them were used on the Shard in London, and they were measuring PM10 and PM2.5 uh, during the construction of this site. There are currently around about 300 uh, Aerocol instruments being used, mostly in the Greater London area on construction sites. Here's an example of um, traffic monitoring. This illustrates how this technology can now be used for uh, monitoring in the microenvironment. Uh, what the New York DEP have done is they've installed AQ65, as you can see, inside uh, a number of vans. And on, on the roof of the van, you can see some solar panels. Uh, they've got a battery bank, and you can see they've got a wind sensor and a, um, a sampling extent extension for the PM and for the gas. On the side of that, that instrument is also an additional enclosure, which has um, gas cylinders in it. So this instrument is set up so you can program automatic calibrations in the field or on demand. Uh, they're using this van for doing uh, mobile monitoring. So they'll go and locate near a either an industrial polluter where there's been some complaints from the community. They can do some investigative uh, monitoring and they can do short-term monitoring in areas where it's just not possible with conventional equipment. So being installed in a van as opposed to a truck or a trailer uh, and much smaller and lighter allows much more agility for uh, the New York City uh, Department of Environment. This example is quite apt for Australia and New Zealand. This was the Waikato Expressway, which uh, was a recent infrastructure project completed a few months ago. So in this case, the uh, consultant, the lead consultant was Coffee Environmental. They actually specified, um, based on the environmental license, they specified the aerocoil instruments to be used for measurement of PM10 and PM2.5. The constructor, uh, Fletcher, so they actually bought the instruments and the data was collected and sent to the New Zealand Transport Agency. Uh, who are responsible for the monitoring. So this is a um, project, although it's completed, they've kept the monitors in place. They're now monitoring the uh, roadside emissions from the completed expressway. So these instruments were set up and used for about two years, uh, two to three years. Initially, they were used for the environmental impact assessment. And you can see that they were um, set up on farmland. Some of them were running on solar panels uh, because there was no infrastructure nearby. And then um, after uh, about six months of baseline data, uh, earthworks were started um, along the expressway. And then they were used for monitoring emissions during construction, and now they're being used for roadside emissions of traffic. Tunnel monitoring is, is a new application where this technology is, is really lending itself uh, due to compact size, and it's robust enough to be um, used in tunnels for two reasons. One is the environmental impact. But secondly, the occupational uh, monitoring of um, the workers in the tunnel where they're exposed to elevated levels of, of PM and gases. So in this example, the mass tunnel in the Netherlands, uh, they've got six uh, stations installed, um, three per tunnel, and they're measuring uh, emissions of PM, NO2 and CO uh, on behalf of Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam municipality. So this project is actually not a new tunnel, it's a refurbishment of an existing tunnel. Um, the tunnel itself is, was completed in 1942, but um, due to changes in the laws of structural concrete in Europe, it meant that the tunnels had to be closed and effectively relined and structurally rebuilt. So this is a three year project that will entail uh, removal of all of the tiles, a lot of the restructuring, and then and re resurfacing of the tunnel. 
as they will be installing this equipment for post refurbishment monitoring as well. Another um, urban application where this technology is being used is in, in metro uh, networks. In this case, Traffic for London are uh, conducting a, um, a study, a two year study measuring PM10 and noise levels at the above ground train station. As you can see, these trains are all running on electricity, so they're not emitting NOx emissions or PM2.5 emissions, but what they're actually detecting is dust from the brakes on these trains and resuspended dust from passing trains. You can see that there's, um, in close proximity, there's sensitive receptors in these urban environments. So as you can see in the circle, there's a noise monitor and an aerocol instrument that's being used for collecting PM and noise uh, data. So just another example of how uh, these advancements in, in monitoring technology really lend itself to answering questions that, that just weren't possible before because of the limitations of conventional equipment. Here's an example that's a little closer to home. As many of you know, the uh, Barangaroo Development Authority has uh, come under scrutiny because of a community, uh, either opposition or there's a lot of stakeholders, of course, have very sensitive receptors in the environment. And because of that, there's a real push to ensure that monitoring is happening on site for environmental and occupational requirements. Those of you who are in Sydney, you're familiar with what the site looks like now, which is like that little picture and what it's planned to look like when it's completed. Currently, there are Aerocall AQM65 stations that are measuring emissions coming from the remediation. The EPA license actually cites the Aerocall dust entry for measuring of, of PM10 um, and 2.5 dust emissions above ground. So just another example of where the um, New South Wales EPA have allowed other or approved other methods other than TOMs and BAMs to enable real-time monitoring of, of dust for environmental and occupational safety. For those of you from Melbourne, you'll be familiar with the Melbourne, Melbourne Metro Rail Project. Site works have already started on a couple of the stations. The EPA, EPA license uh, requires um, dust monitoring to be done at each site. There will be a total of seven metro stations, with, so that's going to require a network of 14 uh, monitoring uh, monitors. And you can see in the picture there, one of them, in this case, uh, John Holland Construction is using the instruments. The monitoring uh, pr uh, consultant is Six Sense, And they were bringing the data from, the air data from these instruments into a package that includes uh, geotechnical data and, and other uh, parameters as well into one database. So uh, really useful that these instruments are able to connect with existing databases and provide real-time data on uh, the uh, Another site close to home is port monitoring. So this is Townsville. Here there is a network of newer instruments that are measuring PM10 and PM2.5. And uh, the requirement has been for PM10 from the bulk handling of coal and fibrous materials, corn and logging, etc. And PM2.5 for measuring diesel emissions as well as um, the emissions from chips. So this is a, a really common uh, type of network that we're starting to see at port uh, as a, a baseline monitoring is certainly PM. Now um, SO2, NO2 and CO are starting to be included in these uh, networks. And again, because of the cost point and the light, lightweight nature of these um, new technologies, you're actually able to create a network for a port where in the past you might have only been able to justify a single uh, reference station. Another application is industrial perimeters. So this is actually from Canada. In this case, Suncor Energy have a fleet of 16 um, Iroquois instruments. They have four sites right next to the forests in Port McMurray. Now, during the summertime, they get uh, forest fires or wildfires, uh, very similar to what happens in, in uh, Sydney. When these forest fires occur, they um, breach the uh, health and safety um, thresholds for employees working on site. So they're measuring uh, PM4 and um, CO, mainly looking for air quality related to smoke and forest fire. However, all these instruments are, are able to measure uh, other fractions as well, such as PM10, 2.5, uh, NO2 as well. So what they're doing is they've got an intranet set up so they can report the air quality to the labour force. Um, and when there is an event, instead of closing the plant, which was costing around about 12 to $15 million a day in lost productivity, 
what they're doing is only closing down parts of the plant that are affected so that the essential production can continue where possible. So in addition to uh, using the data for uh, productivity benefits, they're reporting the data internally for the labour force and they've entered into a partnership with the local community to publish the air quality in the area and that's been a real a real benefit in the relationship with the community is to see Suncor being proactive and actually publishing local air quality data. Example of site remediation, here the client was SO Nord. They uh, decommissioned a, uh, a refinery that was built during the 1960s. During the remediation, SO2 emissions were coming out of the soil. The Norwegian Luft Agency, uh, it's the equivalent of the um, Australian EPA, they allowed uh, non-reference instruments to be used so long as the detection limit of SO2 was below 20 ppb. And of course, these instruments are able to do that. And uh, a network of four units has been measuring SO2 for the last two years uh, and VOCs during this uh, site remediation project. Finally, for community exposure studies, uh, this is an example from China. And here we see um, a batch of instruments that are um, undergoing a site uh, calibration. So we calibrate the instruments in the factory. On, on the PM channels, they're calibrated to Arizona road dust, which is a universal standard. But of course, it's not necessarily representative of the local environment. So in this case, the um, Chinese EMC and Tong Lu have done a calibration to uh, local conditions on the roof of their building, and then those instruments will be deployed throughout the city. Now, in this case, they're actually measuring PM 2.5 and ozone, and that's for smog monitoring, smog monitoring network in this part of China. And the final couple of slides that I wanted to share was this one here just helps us to, to see that these instruments are credible in terms of measurement. Here you see two BAMs, one is PM 10 and one is PM 2.5. Now these were used by um, the aviation in Qatar. The project was to measure the correlation of dust in the air to the um, jet engine performance, and particularly the turbine blades. What GE were finding was that the engine, the engine life of uh, airlines in the Middle East was nowhere near the same as uh, airlines in other parts of the world. And naturally there's a correlation to dust in the air. So they wanted to actually study what this correlation was. So um, they used um, Aerocon instruments. Uh, you can see there the dust uh, profiles that are measuring TSP, PM10, PM2.5, and PM1. So four channels plus eight count channels. And they've integrated uh, meteorological plus visibility with the Aerocon instrument into a single platform. So that's a single instrument platform and a single data platform. Now they had four of these scattered around the airport. Initially, they wanted to do a correlation with the reference method. So they um, hired a couple of BAMs for this correlation. Once they were satisfied with the performance of the instrument, they discontinued with the reference methods. And that was a study that lasted two years. So it's just an example of, of how credible the data is coming from these instruments now that it's no longer necessary to either spend or, or find uh, the uh, Space for reference instruments when you can do everything with one package now. Finally, I wanted to share this slide with you because it is relevant to uh, the activities, particularly in Australia. This comes from the UAE, where uh, a lot of the quarries are uh, required to do PM10 and PM2.5 uh, monitoring in real time. They send this data back to the Ministry of Environment in real time. Some of these sites are remote. You can see it running on a solar panel it's got a battery bank in the box there. Now, what's interesting about this application is that the Ministry of, of Environment uh, required all of the quarries in the UAE to, to do this in an effort to clean up the year. So they're monitoring uh, PM10, PM2.5 in real time. They've also got cameras that are um, uh, watching the activities on each site. And uh, initially, the ministry required US EPA equivalents monitoring. Now, of course, that was going to be extremely uh, uh, high cost burden on the industry. There was significant pushback and uh, the ministry um, acquiesced to allow for non-reference, so um, light scattering methods to be used. But they did require a uh, audit to be done every three months. So a 
a comparison with a gravimetric method. So in this case, we have about 80 sites throughout the UAE on quarries, and our local partner goes to site with a, uh, a thermoparticle. He runs a 24-hour sample, picking up PM10 2.5. And then if it's necessary to do any adjustment to the instrument, uh, he can do that via Aeroquad Cloud. So he does that from the comfort of his office. He doesn't need to go out the site again. He does an adjustment via a K-factor if required. Now that's a sustainable methodology. It's um, had benefits for the industry in that the, the cost burden is significantly less than having uh, reference instruments, but does ensure that the data quality is at the same standard and it meets the requirements of, of government. So it's just an example of how you can bring together the needs of the regulatory requirements, the uh, constraints of industry, and through negotiation, through uh, consultants, uh, you're able to bring together a package that really meets the needs of environmental monitoring. So that's the, the end of this presentation. From my point of view, I hope this has been educational in terms of what's changed in terms of the technology at an urban uh, air monitoring level. Thanks, Paul, for your time today. We appreciate your insights you've provided into the advancements in urban air quality monitoring. And I look forward to seeing you back in Australia in Kazan's next month. Thank you, Peter.